is Vancouver a head office ghost town? The numbers say no, but they also say we're not doing well and the prospects of a change of fortunes are slim and dim, says Jock Finlayson, the past chief economist of the Business Council of BC. The presence or lack of presence of head office speaks volumes about a city. Is it business focused? Does the city government understand or appreciate the needs of a corporate head office? And do they care? And why should you care? I invited Jock Finlayson to join me for a conversation that matters about why Vancouver's only hope to see an expanse in the number of head offices that we have is to promote and support existing firms. Jock, welcome. Yep, thanks for the invitation. Big topic. It is a big topic and, and it's one that has been uh, a part of the makeup of uh, the business climate here in Vancouver and in British Columbia for a long time. What has happened? Um, how come Vancouver seems to have stalled out in being able to uh, build out or attract corporate head offices to yeah. come here? We're, we're a middling performer uh, on head offices. You know, every couple of years, Stats Canada does a survey of what they call head office establishments. And these are really a count of the large Canadian-based companies, uh, effectively. And the latest one counted 2,700 uh, across Canada. And we, we were home, and by when we say Vancouver, we mean Metro Vancouver, the Vancouver Census metropolitan area, not just the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we were home to about 9% of that 2,700, so it's about 240 or so head so, offices. So and that ranks third in the country. Toronto is by far the biggest, then Montreal, then Vancouver. Now, you know, we're 12 or 13% of the Canadian population, so we punch a bit below our weight in terms of the numbers of head offices, but where we really fall down is in head office jobs, because our head offices tend to be smaller than in some of the other Canadian cities. So we're we're third in the number of head offices, but we're actually fourth behind Calgary and, and well behind Calgary in the number of head office jobs. Is that because the dynamics of being in Vancouver are just so expensive that it's hard to support like a larger head office population with salaries that you know will meet the, the, the cost of living in this city? I think in today's circumstances, that statement is very accurate. But if you look at it, it's kind of historically. Um, the reason we have struggled, I think, for a long time, or one of the reasons on, on, in terms of head office retention and growth, is actually our location within North America. I mean, we often don't think about this. We're kind of at the northwest corner of North America. Most of the population of North America is in the east of the US and Canada. The overwhelming majority of the population is in the eastern half of the continent. Um, so we're a long way. I mean, the only place, other city, that's a, with a, within a six hour drive or train uh, trip from Vancouver is Seattle. I mean, so we're, we sometimes think of ourselves as advantaged because of the Asia Pacific exposure but within the North American context our geography actually works against us. Well I find it interesting that you bring up the Seattle uh, you know comparison and they're close. You take a look at Seattle. Seattle's home to a lot of head offices and not just national head offices they have international head offices. Microsoft, Amazon, Boeing, uh, on and on and on. So Starbucks. what is it? <laughs> yeah, Starbucks. What is it about that culture? Yeah, that is different than ours because, as you point out, they're in the same geographical. Yeah, I think Seattle is an anomaly uh, in the context of America. It's a, it's a fascinating story. Why did some of the the biggest aircraft manufacturer in the world, Microsoft, which spends more on R and D than the Canadian private sector collectively? I mean, a huge, huge enterprise. Uh, even Starbucks, I mean, one of the most recognizable and iconic consumer brands. Why did these companies germinate and sort of take root and grow? Uh, Costco, you're right, we pale compared to Seattle in the sort of dynamism and, and scope of our, of our corporate head office sector. But, you know, Seattle's, I think, unique in some respects. So. Okay, if we take a look at the, the culture in Seattle, though, it, it really is driven in, in some ways much more like uh, Calgary. I remember one time I went to Calgary and they went, oh, you're from uh, BC, are you? And I went, yeah, they, and they said, Vancouver. And I went, right, and we call, oh yeah, we call that the no-can-do city. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> well, you, you say, well, can you do this? No, no-can-do. Whereas in Calgary, and I think in Seattle, they have this sense of, 
oh yeah, no, well, that's a good idea. Let's give that a try. <laughs> <laughs> do we not have that sense here in British Columbia? And does it then play a role in how companies grow yeah. uh, and are can attract talent sure. and are supported? I think historically, S Seattle probably was more of a can-do place than uh, the, the Metro Vancouver. I would say contemporary Seattle reminds me quite a bit of Vancouver. It's expensive. Uh, its politics is decidedly to the left in terms of the city of Seattle itself. It's fragmented regionally, and this is an issue we, we should talk about a bit in terms of the head office economy. Seattle's like Vancouver in that you've got the city, city of Seattle, mm -hmm. but then you get all these other suburban communities, some of which are actually much more vibrant than Seattle itself, and I think that's increasingly the case here as well. But Vancouver, um, I, you know, I've been here for about 25 years, and I've never detected much hunger or interest among our decision makers, uh, in, in particularly in government, including local government, um, to understand the head office economy or try and build it or even recognize the contributions that it can make. So it's never been a focus. Well, I find that somewhat confusing in a way because I know that Vancouver and the region is a good incubator environment. We. There's a lot of innovation. There's a lot of great ideas that come out of here. And for uh, smaller or medium-sized businesses, the cost of being able to attract some talent to, to grow is underwritten because, well, you go, well, now I don't, have to buy, I don't have to pay for your health insurance. And there are other things that are of some benefits to companies as they're growing, but then they hit the ceiling and then they go, okay, well, we're going somewhere else. Um, so the taxpayer <laughs> helped to the inc incubate, but doesn't get yeah. the benefit of having grown because it's as though there's a ceiling on that. And how do we then help move them forward? Like how often do we see a company like Stem Cell Technologies grow the way that it did and then stay here? We're good for small business. I agree with you. The entrepreneurial climate uh, is, is, is positive. Uh, there's lots of entrepreneurs here, there's lots of finance available for very early stage ventures, and that's improving dramatically in the tech space, by the way. Um, we've got good universities and colleges, so entry level work, uh, sort of workforce development, I think is a strength as well. Um, and we got lots of talent here. So that really helps at the kind of upstream end of uh, business formation and early stage growth. The challenge we've had for a long time is scaling our firm, so that growing what I would call global scale or at least North American scale companies that stick here in terms of their head offices. And that's what Stats Canada is counting. Well, that addresses one of the questions that I posed in the intro, like, well, what's the benefit to a city and, and why should we care? Yeah, there's three big benefits from, from having a robust corporate head office sector. One is uh, a lot of high paying jobs are attached to head offices because of the management functions that are domiciled there. Um, and those high paying jobs, of course, increase the tax base, uh, they increase household incomes, um, and have kind of spillover benefits. So, you know, if you have your choice, you'd rather have high paying jobs than low paying jobs in the, in the, in the city. The second uh, benefit is all the other goods and services that corporate head offices procure in the local market. So goods, but particularly what I would call high-end, high-value-added services. So financial services, legal, accounting, consulting, uh, you know, PR, uh, human resource expertise. Head offices do a lot of the procurement of those expensive, high-value services. And they tend to disproportionately procure them from the local markets in which they're domiciled. Are we starting to see a little bit of well, a hollowing well, we out of those head yeah. offices? The yeah. head office stays here, but a lot of the Yeah, key. yeah. Well, the head office is here, and you know, if production isn't going to be here in the future, maybe well, we lose then, them. Right, but yeah. up until now, anyway, they procure billions of dollars of legal, accounting, financial, environmental expertise, engineering expertise, transportation services, obviously. So that's the second benefit. And then the third one is community, cultural, and philanthropic support. There is a, you know, the literature shows a strong positive relationship between the amount of money that is raised from the private sector for these kinds of purposes, whether it's the opera or the hospitals or whatever, um, and the robustness of your corporate economies. Is there an additional benefit in the sense that if you have the people who are running a company living in the city, they are far more connected to 
uh, like as you talked about community and social services and, and cultural services, but there's this sense of well, you know, your kids go to the school that my kids go to, or down the street from. Like we were invested in the same community in a way that you don't when it's three thousand kilometers. To yeah, me. totally. I mean, it's hard to quantify that. It's kind yeah. of an intangible, but yeah, it has to do with the uh, in in a sense the nature of the business leadership you would have in your in your city or in your community or your region. If you've got uh, a significant sort of critical mass of, of, of corporate offices uh, headquartered in your community, you're going to benefit from that sort of intangible capital, I would call it, mm -hmm. that flows from the fact that the people running these enterprises and rising up the ranks uh, in, in the different parts of the business are rooted in the community for, for the most part, even if they're recruited from somewhere else, they're going to work here, have their careers here. So um, that that's important. So is the development of industry clusters. It's hard. I hear a lot of politicians talk about clusters. I don't think they probably aren't too familiar with the literature on it. Um, clusters are built around firms. They're not built around a speech given by a minister or a government document. And firms are run by people. Um, and uh, a critical mass of firms in a particular industry is the fundamental prerequisite for having a vibrant cluster. And you want some of them to be large, too. Mm -hmm. If they're all small, it's hard to see the cluster congeal. So you need what we call in economics some anchor companies um, that, in a sense, help to ground the, the industry cluster in a particular region. And we've got, we, we have some of that here. I mean, well, it, we do. <clears throat> you know, we've got the super cluster, uh, you know, focused on uh, IT. Digital uh, services, yeah. And, yeah. and and so it is starting to coalesce and, and to foster that environment. But if you take a look at biomedical engineering and life sciences companies, there seems to be clusters there that are emerging almost organically. How important is it that we support those? Yeah, I think we're very fortunate here in this region um, uh, and, and in BC that even though we don't really have a strategy <laughs> a, a policy strategy or the institutional infrastructure in place to kind of directly and deliberately build uh, the, the technology economy in particular, it is kind of organically emerging. I've been very taken uh, aback over the last year or so at the rapid growth of unicorn companies in the technology space. This is a really big deal for, mm -hmm. for the province and metro. We've had in since December 2020, We've had 13 unicorns emerging in different parts of the tech space. So these are these are companies that have scaled, at least in terms of their value. And we've struggled for a long time in our tech sector to create the conditions where we would see rapid growth and kind of the scaling of companies. Something seems to have happened in a positive way in the past couple of years because there's real evidence that we're, we're hitting our stride on that. And that... That's helpful in the, in, in the context of head offices because at least some of these companies hopefully will continue to scale um, and they'll retain their headquarters here mm -hmm. and they will become global sort of technology players based in, in BC and Metro Vancouver. And that's, that's a good place to end up if, if that's where we end up. Well, it would be, it would be great and it would be fantastic if uh, there was an actual strategy to help support that. One of the questions though that arises is, you know, we talk about taxes and the tax benefit to the region from having these headquarters there, here. But when we take a look at the tax structure around personal income taxes and the impact that it will have on these high earners who are especially at the top and, and the, you know, the lead decision makers in these companies, they also take a look at the personal tax rate. And are we not necessarily the most friendly environment to people who are making significant amounts of money. Yeah. Well, I'm not somebody who believes taxes drive the bus in terms of all business decisions, because if they did, <clears throat> a place like Mississippi would be a lot more prosperous than it is, and California would be less prosperous. So we have to be careful. But I do believe that, you know, we have some, we have some headwinds for, for growing our, our, our corporate economy here. Part of it is business taxes, where uh, our, our, our corporate tax rates are four percentage points higher in BC than in Alberta and also higher than Washington State. At the margin that, you know, is a bit of a growth impediment. <clears throat> um, a bigger one is on the personal side and mm -hmm. uh, 
where we've got uh, high combined federal provincial marginal rates. 53.5% is the top combined tax rate on employment income, uh, earned income in, uh, in BC. And in Alberta, it's 48, and in Washington State, it's 37. So if you picture somebody who's paid 500,000 US a year, like a senior manager in a technology company, not the CEO, he or she would be paid more. But say somebody who's a, you know, a, a top manager, um, 500,000 US, that's 625,000 Canadian. That job in Seattle would pay, in Canadian dollar terms, 60 to 70,000 less per year in income tax than the same job here. In, in, at the 60 same to 70,000 dollars a year <clears throat> less. In, in Canadian dollar right. terms. So that's a material <laughs> gap. Like a few thousand dollars doesn't matter, but that's, that's a pretty big gap. And for people that are making more money than that, and I realize most people watching this program are not going to cry themselves to sleep at night worrying about the well-being of you know highly paid people. I get that, but if you want to grow your corporate economy, you need you know you you need senior level decision makers to want to live and work in your jurisdiction and build their business. And I do think on the personal tax side, both in Canada generally, but certainly in BC, that we push the envelope too far. Um, and it is it's obviously not going to kill everything because we we have we have successful firms here but it doesn't help uh, in attracting and retaining talent and it probably doesn't help in growing uh, even our, our BC based companies and <coughs> does it make it almost more challenging for us to then look to uh, other head offices that are looking to relocate and saying well you know we're here in Vancouver come here um, yeah I think the the whole reload I mean some some companies do do relocate there's a few examples I can think of well, CP rail do. back in the 80s some of the big oil companies like Imperial oil they were actually headquartered in Toronto Suncor actually at one point was headquartered in Toronto They've all my uh, uh, pipeline companies, they've all moved to Calgary. Right. Uh, Boeing famously moved its head office out of Seattle to Chicago, you know, right. 10 or 15 years ago. So it does happen, but it's exceedingly rare. Well, I, Finning left, uh, Vancouver based company Finning went to Edmonton back then. Finning in, Canada. Yeah, yeah, Finning International is still here. And yeah. of course, recently, Elon Musk uh, yeah, very publicly moved the head office of Tesla, or at least he moved himself. I don't know if yeah. he moved the head office from California to Texas. And I you know, follow his tweets, which are, are voluminous. So he was <laughs> dumping on California and kind of praising Texas. So it does happen, yeah. but that is not how we or anybody will be successful in building a stronger head office uh, economy. It's not gonna be by poaching head offices from somewhere else. And in fact, I would just park that. I think it's a fantasy. But yeah. It's about growing your existing firm, so more of them scale to reach a size where they would get into the Stats Canada count of the 2,700 head offices. That's where the focus should be, not on poaching, but on growing our own. And, and w we also have some real chance of doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, poaching is almost impossible, I think, for a place like Vancouver. I think it's, 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 it's a forlorn hope. But we could grow even more of our successful BC companies into global players. And that's where I'd be putting my, my energy if I was a policymaker. And if we don't grow those, what do you see as being like the business climate future for British Columbia? Will we start to move really into this? We're, you know, uh, an extension of other organizations and they have a presence here, but it's really at the retail or, or small yeah. commercial level. I mean, we, we, I wouldn't necessarily put it that way. I mean, people often talk about the gap between the cost of living, and particularly the cost of housing, and incomes mm -hmm. here in Metro Vancouver, which I think is a big issue. Uh, this is a way to help close that gap, not eliminate it, but uh, to narrow it a bit if we had a stronger cadre of corporate head offices, and more importantly, if we had more head office jobs. I mean, Calgary has, you know, 75% more head office jobs, I think, than we do even though they have fewer head offices, right. the, the, but the head offices are bigger and they have more jobs. And that helps the income base in Calgary and it makes life more affordable for, for many of the people living there. Even though Calgary has 1.4 million people and we have 2.6 million. So now Calgary is a bit of an unusual case um, because it's, it's, it's energy centric. I mean, it's a lot, a lot of their head offices are in and around 
the broad kind of energy economy, which may be a problem for them going forward, to be, to be fair. But they've been successful, and, I, and, I think, and they've been very focused on it. We haven't been focused on that. I, don't think, yeah. I doubt that the city council in Vancouver, or Surrey, has ever had a meeting where they focused intently on who are our head offices in our community today, what industries they're in, how can we help them grow, um, and how can we build a stronger head office economy. That does not appear to be a conversation item among local politicians for the most part in Metro Vancouver. They're much you know, more focused on other things. So it, again, it hasn't been a priority, which may help to explain why we are a middling performer. I remember doing a uh, Tale of Two Cities series <coughs> back when I was, you know, doing daily reporting at that cable station out in Burnaby. I remember. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I went to Calgary, and they and they had consolidated federal, provincial, and municipal, you know, business offices all into one office, so that if you wanted to do something in Calgary. You only had one stop, and you were put in touch with each one of the, you know, the counterparts in each in each office. And I went, "This is a great idea." I came back to Vancouver. <laughs> um, I'm then uh, interviewing then Premier Glenn Clark in the Premier's office down at the uh, uh, Canada Place, and I said, "You know, they've got this. Like, what do we have?" And he and he looked towards the window, and he goes that. Well, the province uh, in those days, and even to some extent now, is not, not terribly involved in this. And I, You know, it's funny, the, the future prosperity of BC hinges very importantly on Metro Vancouver's success as a global city region. And it, it's about a lot more than head offices. It's obviously livability, right. housing costs, uh, you know, quality of life, uh, even, you mm -hmm. know, quality of infrastructure. But the province um, uh, and this this is not a partisan comment. It goes back, you know, through multiple governments. The province has never paid much attention to that. In other yeah. words, they don't sort of get up in the morning and say, uh, over in the legislative assembly, that you know the future of BC hinges very importantly on how how things go in Metro Vancouver and uh, and and the Lower Mainland. Uh, so there's no it that doesn't seem to connect, and it's odd in a way because a lot of other jurisdictions would see their biggest cities, and let's recognize Metro Vancouver's over half of the BC economy, mm -hmm. um, and, a, and an even larger share of our innovation and things like that. Um, but a lot of the other jurisdictions that I follow, they pay more attention to the health and vibrancy and dynamism and governability mm -hmm. of their biggest kind of city regions. And, and our, our, our province has really struggled to, to kind of come to that realization because they have a lot of the power and a lot of the tools to do things if they choose to use them. Well, thank you, John. Thanks for coming in and giving us a lay of the land and uh, talking about some of the opportunities, advantages, and challenges. Thanks very much.